kingdom, six of them today. Now, there are 30 parables that are major. Some say there are up to 72 parable type sayings of Jesus in all of his ministry, but there are really major and minor parables. And I can't cover all the parables in six to ten weeks. So I've selected some of the favorite ones, which we've looked at, the parable of the Good Samaritan. We looked at the uh, parable of uh, the prodigal son. We, uh, pardon? The coin. Oh, the coin. Yeah, the coins. Yeah. And uh, today, why did Jesus talk in parables? He talked in parables because he wanted to make truth simple to those who could understand so he used common things like coins, like people, like servants, like uh, uh, what are some other examples of what Jesus said? Pearl. uh, pearls. Yeah, today it's a pearl of, of great price. So uh, treasures in the field. So Jesus used common languages that everybody understood in Israel, but they couldn't understand the meanings unless they were given revelation. Jesus spoke in parables, so the Religious leaders couldn't understand, but so the simple minds that knew his love could understand. And he, his parables were reserved for his children, his own. So uh, uh, Jesus just uh, used parables to describe the kingdom of God. It's authority, it's value, it's secrets. We're going to look at those three things today. Uh, today we study several of the key parables that give us deeper revelation into God's kingdom. Remember, it's the gospel of the what? Kingdom. kingdom that will be revealed around the world to all yes. nations right before the coming of the bridegroom king, Jesus. Hallelujah. And today's teaching, we'll see a multitude of parables defining the kingdom of God. Now, you say, Jerry, how can you teach on so many parables? We're going to do it quickly. We're not going to spend a lot of time. But Jesus in Matthew 13, how many did he give? One after another, after another, after another. So Jesus used the same teaching style. So I'm going to use Jesus' teaching style today. Is that all right? So we're going to do what Jesus did. Number one, the treasure of the kingdom. That shows its value. The treasure of the kingdom. Now, I really got praying about this, studying it, and I find out there are two meanings in this. Uh, if you want to turn to that, you can find it in Matthew 13, actually. It's the first two parables that Jesus gave. And uh, he said this. Now let me read it. All right. This is Matthew 13, verse 44. In your Bibles, if you've got your Bibles open. If you don't, you can go to iPads and all kinds of new ways to get the Bible today. <laughs> I use my iPad a lot. I still like to hold the Word of God. Oh, it feels so good. There's something about the book itself, you know. And we like the book. Amen, Socrates. We like it. We love it. Hidden treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all that he had and brought it and bought that field. Now this shows the value, the value of the kingdom of God. I want to tell you, nothing in the universe compares to God's kingdom. That's right. The kingdom of God is everlasting. It stands. When everything else is going to fail, what's going to remain? We go back to Hebrews 12 all the time. I will shake everything that can be shaken. I don't care what you see on this planet Earth right now. It's going to get shaken. Every nation is going to get shaken, including America and Germany. Shame. Yeah. All these nations are going to get shaken. It says, I, I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken so that which cannot be shaken may what? Remain. Remain for we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So the only thing in the end that's going to remain is the kingdom. How many want to be associated with something that's going to be around forever? Would you like that? I think I want to be associated with this kingdom. So I want to learn more about the kingdom. And the Bible says what? Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness because the kingdom is His righteousness. And then all these what? Things will be added unto you. Paul said, I count all things but dung. Now, we won't define that word. <laughs> I was raised on a farm. We used to haul a lot of it out to the, the farm when, uh, with our cattle, you know. Uh, the dung. He said, I got all things but dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. For whom I have suffered the 
loss of all things. Well, when we let everything else go and we have what really is valuable remaining, you're further ahead. You see, I, I, I see all these things out there today that look so attractive. Come on, the world's attractive, isn't it? There are a lot of things that, you know, I'd like a house by the beach. My wife and I, for uh, two days, we're, or three days, we're down on, on Anne Marie Island. Walking the beach, having our 30th wedding anniversary, and thank all the, all those folks. Maybe a lot of people thank, you know, congrat, thank you for congratulating us. Appreciate it. 30 great years, amen? And uh, it's been wonderful years. I have a good, good wife. She's full of wisdom, full of good revelation. We sat and talked a lot all this whole weekend about the kingdom of God. She's got a revelation of the kingdom. And we walk in harmony about the kingdom, I'll tell you. And the second great revelation we have together is Christ in us. She got that a little bit before me. And so I had to kind of catch up with her on that. But she really got a revelation of that when I got home from Africa and was sick and was dying. And she began to practice the kingdom with me. And I believe it delivered me. I believe the truths that she was giving me probably saved my life. Because I was beginning to fall off the edge. How many of you can fall off the edge when things get dark? And it's good to have somebody by your side that knows kingdom and knows Christ in you. So the hidden treasure. Now, how, tra how valuable is this treasure? When you discover it, and you know its value, you will sell everything you have to purchase that field. One day I was walking through a field. And my field, I, I thought at the time was pretty fancy. I had on to an engine airplane flying around doing evangelism and eh, I'm caught up here on this thing. Uh, doing evangelism and, and I thought the field looked pretty good. Well, God wasn't impressed. How many know we don't impress God with our own field? And uh, doing evangelism full time and one crusade after another. I was going years at a time without taking a break and just we were moving. On television, 36 television stations and things were happening and all kinds of, you know, good things. And I thought they were good. But God let me go through a storm. How many know storms define your Foundations. We're going to look at that at the later parable of the two kinds of houses that are built. Storms are God's way to reveal your foundation. And my foundation in 1976 wasn't very secure. I'm telling you, it wasn't. I thought it was. But God didn't think it was. So he shook my foundation. And I was walking through a field and I stubbed my toe on something that's sticking up a little bit. And I thought, what's that? Looks like a chest. So I began to dig it up and guess what it was? A treasure. I discovered a treasure in the field. I was up in the mountains of Colorado. You know the story. I won't repeat it. But, you know, God gave me a revelation. He I heard his voice, and to this day, I don't know if it's audible or not. It seemed audible to me. He said, Jerry, I'm going to make you a kingdom man. I said, what's that? I was a good evangelical evangelist. He said, I'm going to take you to a boy. <laughs> and I went home from that mountain, and I looked all through my library, which I had 2,000 volumes, and not one volume on the kingdom. My whole library was built with no kingdom. How can that happen? It happens to a lot of preachers out there that may, some of you may be listening. You may have a whole library and very little kingdom. So you know what I did to that library? I gave it all away. All 2,000 volumes. 40 boxes I back, packed up and gave to a little Bible college down in Denver that didn't know the kingdom. I figured, well, I'll just give them the books and let them work on it. And I found a little cassette tape by, by Derek Prince called wow. The Kingdom of God. In those days, all we had was cassettes. All my music was on cassettes. All my teaching cassettes were the thing. So I put that in my cassette player and began to play it. And I'm telling you, I got a revelation of the kingdom of God. I've mentioned it before. I played that tape so many times it wouldn't play anymore. I think I played it 50 times. 
I wanted to learn what the kingdom of God was and nobody ever explained it to me in university and, and seminary. Come on. Wake up Amen. out there. Education without the kingdom of God is, is not Christian or education, either one. Yes. It's just a lot of noise. Yes. Because the gospel of the kingdom is the end time gospel that Jesus preached. I didn't know it. I didn't understand it. It comes by revelation. And when I discovered that field, treasure. I literally, at that time, lost everything I had. But I, what I gained was the kingdom. It's powerful. And so, there's a second side to this story, which I, I when I really begin to think of Matthew 13, I begin to reevaluate this parable. Because traditionally, what it, what it means is that we, who discover the kingdom, will buy that fee, field, and we are willing to give up all that we have to purchase that field. But listen, I believe this also could mean that this refers to God. This is God's field. He called the field in other parables the world. And God reevaluated the earth world and He said, what can I do to get back my world? The devil's stolen it. So God said, I'm going to send something that's going to change everything. Amen. And the one in the field, I believe, is the sun. And you know what he discovers? The treasure. But to get that treasure, which say, which is me, say it. The treasure in the field is me. For the son to purchase you, he had to give everything he had. Leave the glory of his father's presence. Become a man. Literally lost everything. Hung on a cross naked and without anything. Was buried in a borrowed tomb. Literally gave everything, including his blood, to purchase the treasure. Because, watch this, because he saw in the treasure the power to repossess the earth. That's you. He was willing to give all to buy his bride. Are, are you grateful for that? Oh, yeah. This is the greatest demonstration of love in the Bible. Yeah. Had nothing left. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being, and watch this, being in the form of God, thought it ro not robbery to be equal with God. He was God. Yeah. But, watch this, but he made himself of no reputation. So, uh, Philippians 2 took upon himself the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of man, and being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. Wow. We won't go there, but we can spend time there. So Jesus gave everything to purchase this treasure, which is you and I, his bride. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That you saw in me the value. You saw me in the Bible. To die for me. To die for me. If he didn't consider you valuable, he would not have died for you. Yeah. So start declaring it. See, I... Jerry, you don't know all the problems I've had. You don't know all the background I've had. You don't know where I've come from. Doesn't matter. You're his treasure. Amen. You're also the pearl of great price. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking a beautiful pearl. Or pearls. Uh, that when he has found the one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, Jesus' love for us. Wow. You're that pearl. And you know what he's doing right now for you? 
He's preparing a place for you. Yeah. He's going to take good care of his bride. Amen? Amen. He's got a place prepared for you. He said, if I prepare a place, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And then we get the joy of his presence for eternity. Come on. We experienced a little bit this morning in the spirit, you know, worship. I just like tuning into the Lord. Amen. So much fun. <coughs> you and I are the treasure and the pearl. I believe that's part of this parable. The other part is, is it is a hidden treasure for us. When I discovered the kingdom of God, all my other education didn't mean a thing. I'm serious. All those years of training and learning, I believe they helped me in the foundation. Because we're going to look at the later parable of the power of the foundation. is very important. So first of all, the treasure. Say it with me. The treasure of the kingdom. The Secondly, the authority of the kingdom. All right? The authority of the kingdom. Go to the next uh, slide, if you would. The authority of the kingdom. All right? Um, here it is. Another parable. A man had two sons. Now, what do these two sons represent? This is really an interesting parable. I, I wish we had time to go with the background of all why Jesus gave these parables. Because he's going to demonstrate in this parable two attitudes. One attitude is the father told the sons, go out into the vineyard and work. So he told his oldest son, and you know what the son did? He said, okay, dad, I will. But he didn't go. Now the younger son, maybe he overslept, you know, maybe he's just a little bit uh, lazy. We don't know all of the background. But he said, you know, Dad, no, really, I, I, I'm not interested in working in the vineyard today. Got other things on my plate. Too busy, too tired. After all, I stayed out too late last night, and blah, blah, you know. And he said, Dad, I, I just, I, I'm not going to go. And so he rejected his father, which in the culture of the Jewish people, family was very disrespectful. But then he went back to bed or wherever he went and, and he got thinking. You know, this is my father. You know, it's better to obey God in word, in action than in word. Amen? So he ended up going to the vineyard. Now this is a simple little parable but it's full of meaning. This is powerful. Because what Jesus is doing is rebuking the religious leaders who had a form of godliness. They're going to keep all the ritual of the law. They're going to wear their robes and their high flute and stuff. And they're going to look good and speak the right words and say the right things and be religious. But the younger son, who seemed a little rebellious, which is really characteristic of most of us. You know what rebellion is? Jesus defined it. Rebellion is not wanting, wanting to come under his rulership. That's rebellion. Every time God gives us a command that we don't want to obey, you know, we say, oh Lord. But this younger son thought about it. He said, I'm going to respect my father. I'm going to go into the field. I'm going to work today and do it. Now Jesus said, boy, when he came back, he walked over to the Pharisees and he said, let me tell you the truth about this parable. Let's read it. And Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. Wow. <laughs> Just be one of these Pharisees standing there so religiously righteous, self-righteous. And Jesus walks up to your face and says, Tax collectors and harlots get into the kingdom before you. Whew. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward repent or relent and believe on him. By the way, who did Jesus choose to walk with him? 
tax collectors, <coughs> old fishermen. <laughs> Mary Magdalene was not a, one of the twelve disciples, but she, she was the one out of whom seven demons came. You know, it's really interesting. One reason I loved going to the streets of San Francisco back in 1970 or 1985 and on those years I was on the streets is I found the people on the streets that were desperate would, find, would, would bow their knee to Jesus. The right self-righteous of the church, they just doing their thing. But I like people that are hungry, amen? Amen. Desperate. They really want Jesus. Amen. And that's what Jesus said. Now these disciples, and this is about authority, because the disciples said, whose authority are you operating on? They challenged Jesus. That led into this parable. The verses right before this parable, they're challenging Jesus' authority. By what authority do you come and why are you acting like you do? You, you, who do you think you are? That's what they were saying, the religious leaders to Jesus. Who do you think you are? Who gave you that authority? Jesus said, I'm not going to tell you. So he came back with the question. You see, Jesus really knew how to answer. He said, by what authority did John the Baptist operate? Now, uh, they couldn't answer that. I'll tell you why they couldn't answer. Because John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets and they didn't receive him. Not only that, the people that came out to the river to get baptized were the, were the sinners. But the religious folks, they, they rejected John. And so if they outwardly said, no, John was not a prophet, then the people would attack them. So they said, we can't tell you. We can't answer that, Jesus. And Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I operate. And then he gave this parable. The father had two sons. In the end, what's going to be judged is how you respond to Jesus' authority. That's, that's going to be the thing that judges you in the end. Are you willing to come under that authority? So that's the parable of the two sons. Then we have the parable of the mustard seed. This is talking about authority of the kingdom. Now, uh, when I went to Israel, I got some mustard seeds. I wanted to bring some back. I thought that would be a good illustration to have mustard seeds to show the class, right? But you know when I came back into the United States, they wouldn't let me bring my mustard seeds in. They confiscated them at the border. When I flew back into the U.S. from Israel, when I was in Israel a few years ago, they took my mustard seeds. So I asked the guy, I said, why are you taking my mustard seeds? He said, if we allow mustard seeds to come into the USA, they will take over. <laughs> what is that? He said, those 30 or so mustard seeds will spread like fire. Then I understood Jesus' parable. Wow. The mustard seeds, so small in the hand, 30 of them, you can hardly see them. But the U.S. government was afraid that if we got the seeds into the ground of the U.S. soil, they'd begin to take over the soil of America. That's interesting. So Jesus used that as an illustration, as a parable. And what did he say? That he's, uh, it's found again in, in Matthew 13. The mustard seed, which is indeed the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Wow. The power of the mustard seeds is its power to increase. Now, I often measure what I'm doing by size. We're all threatened to do that. Say, well, we don't have a lot of people and we should have a bigger university by now and we should have made much more of an impact. And I look at other ministries and it looks like they're getting blessed with their socks off and, uh, you know, just, it, it just, it's crazy. And so I have to stop and evaluate. And you know what Jesus always says to me? I pray the first of every year. You want me to change anything I'm doing? He said, just keep doing what you're doing. He said, the seeds that you're planting around the world and the campuses and the teaching and the training online, all you people coming on that want kingdom, 
See, Canaan's like leaven. It's like under the ground. You don't see it. It's, it's, it's hidden. So much of the kingdom is hidden, but when it blossoms out, and when, watch this, when everything else goes away, then it appears. Because it lasts. So I'm not measuring my ministry by size. In my first nine years, we were hopping right along. We were... People were saying, you've got to be another Jerry Falwell and even had his video team show up at a crusade we were holding in Omaha, Nebraska. And it was Rex Humbard's whole video team. I'll never forget it. And these guys show up in the back of my crusade in their shark skin suits. They'd flown in their private Learjet from Rex Humbard's ministry. And they'd already made Rex Humbard and Jerry Falwell worldwide. And they came to me at the end of the crusade and they said, you know, we've been examining ministries in America. We believe the next large ministry. And we'd like to meet you for breakfast. Of course, my ego. Wow. Okay. I'm going to be another Rex Hobart, another Jerry Falwell, I'm going to be on worldwide television. They said, we know how to put you on worldwide television because we sell gospel albums the last two minutes of your TV program and that pays for the entire program. We already know the TV stations that will self-pay for themselves in 30 days. They came out with a colored magazine for me. I had my own colored magazine. Came out with all new graphic stuff. We began to shoot television and I went on 36 television stations and it looked like this ministry was going to explode out to the world. But God had a better idea. The Securities and Exchange Commission went into Jerry Falwell and Rex Humbard ministry and said, you have sold securities illegally. Mm. And for 90 days, they guaranteed all of the income of those ministries. I'm showing you how God works. Mm -hmm. For 90 days, they took all the income of Jerry Falwell's ministry, all the income of Rex Humbard's ministry, and threatened that these guys even... Now, it wasn't Jerry Falwell and Rex Humbard's problem. It was the people they'd hired. They just didn't know what they were doing. And in 90 days, the Dave Beaver associates that had flown out to see me and make me the next big ministry in the world went bankrupt. They called me up and they said, Jerry, we have bad news. We've lost everything. The IRS has taken everything. Well, Rex Humbard and Jerry Falwell made it through. They hired attorneys, were in court for a long time, got things straightened out. But our ministry, expanding to the world, what happened? Went away. The ship sank. <laughs> and all the dreams I had, yeah, I mean, we looked good. And the Lord taught me something. Don't ever measure your ministry by size. Amen. If you measure your ministry by size, Jesus failed. Yeah. Twelve? Hello? You're going to change the world with twelve? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Twelve men you're going to spend three years with? Yeah. <clears throat> How many know Jesus knew what he was doing? And by the way, he had no guarantees. Even at the cross, they were following him at a, a distance. Yeah. Only his mother and John and Mary hung out with him at the cross. Everybody else abandoned him. How many know sometimes things can look a little weary? <laughs> a little thin. But three days later. Amen. I mean, they, it looked like it was all over. They put him in a grave. They wrapped him in. Borrowed clothing. Put him in a burial robe that wasn't even his. Put him in a borrowed tomb. I mean, hello, this is the creator of the universe. But three days later, wow, came out of the grave. And then 50 days later, the fire fell. I know. And he ignited a 
ignition that has gone on now for millenniums. The kingdom is rising. Amen. How many believe that the kingdom is rising? All right, we're almost finished. Not only is there treasure of the kingdom, it's value not only the authority of the kingdom, the power of the two sons, the parable of the two sons, and the authority that Jesus said was given, and, and the parable of the mustard seed. But now, what are the what's the operation of the kingdom? Two couple of parables that are very, very powerful. One is the parable of the two of the talents. Now there was a man that had uh, all these servants, and he gave each servant a certain uh, amount of talents and said, take this money now and multiply it. And I'm going to report back later and, and tell me how it was used. So this is the operation of the kingdom. And this is very important, by the way. Let's read about it in Matthew chapter 25. For to everyone who has, more will be given. And he will have an abundance, but from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. That doesn't sound fair. I mean, here's this one guy who says, you're a very uh, austere boss, and I was afraid I'd lose this talent, so I buried it. And when you return, here's the talent. Well, the man that had five talents got five more. So Jesus took the one talent and gave it to the man that had the most talents. What? Ten talents. And multiply. What is this about? The key to the kingdom is learn to fun function in it. Learn to operate in the power of the kingdom. Trevor, uh, it's interesting because we talked a little bit before and, and I said, man, you are getting this beat thing down, you know, and he says, well, I, I start to play and then he says, I, I back off because... I, don't, I feel it's me playing. And I say, now God, you take over. And he says, now when I begin to hit the bongos, I really feel it's God doing it. <laughs> Isn't he doing good up here? Yeah, he's getting this rhythm thing down. And he's leading us because rhythm always leads the band, so to speak, the worship team. Mm -hmm. I think you learned this key. Back off from yourself and let God take over and multiply it. Everything that God touches multiplies. Yes. yes. That's the mustard seed. The mustard seed, the power of the mustard seed is that it has a power of increase on it. The kingdom has a power of increase on it. And if you learn those secrets, God will multiply you. The people you touch, the people that, that you minister to, the money that you put into the kingdom, God will multiply it. He'll increase it. Wow. The parable of the talents. Well, I won't go spend a long time there, but just to say that the, the, the uh, vineyard owner came back and said, now I want to see what you've done with this tal the talents I've given you. And by the way, every one of us are going to be judged according to the way we've used our talents. Yes. And we've been faithful. How have we been faithful? And I appreciate some of you that have been faithful out here at Kingdom Life University. Week after week you come, God bless you. And some of you online and our campus director, some of you, you're there. You're really serving. You're really, you have a heart for this. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are diversities of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but the same God who works all in all. Watch this. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Say, I've been given. Say with me. I've been given gifts by Jesus. And I'm going to function in those gifts by the power of the Spirit and multiply what He's given me. I love it. All right. And we're all going to be held accountable. Look at 1 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. So we're going to be judged someday. And the last parable is the parable of the wise and foolish builder. I'm going to spend just a few minutes on this one. I love it. All these parables, I could, I could do a whole message on it, but we don't have time. So we've gone through them pretty quickly. But I love this parable. 
Because both of the men in this parable, Jesus said, desired to build a house. Now, what is a house? Well, your, your home is a house. Your family is a house. The house of Jacob. Right? The nation is a house. We actually have something called the House of Representatives. We have something called the White House. So there are different representations of houses. But what is the house being built on? Foundation. The foundation of the house is the key. Now, uh, that's a house on... Doesn't that look pretty? Isn't that a pretty little castle there? They have a, they have a contest out of Clearwater Beach every year. It's a three-day contest of sculptors coming in from all over the world and building sculptors. Have, has anybody ever seen that? Yes. Yeah. Have you been out to Clearwater Beach? They are phenomenal. These guys are artists, man. They spend, they know how to harden that sand and they build these beautiful, beautiful edifices. And I, I love to go out there and see what they build. And it's, it's interesting. They're, they're genuine artists. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they're built on what? Sand. sand. If you went out to Clearwater Beach, you wouldn't even know what they built last year. Show the other house. I like this. What's the other one? Does that look pretty solid? Yeah. Now go back to the sand a moment. Which of these two houses is easier to build? You could probably build the sand in one day. Right? How many know a lot of people like to build quick? But how many know that God takes time? He's got a lot invested in you and me. Now, God has a lot invested, a lot of time. And He has been through a lot of struggles with us. He suffered in all points like as we. You think Jesus doesn't notice when you're going through trials? Isn't it interesting that Jesus sent the disciples out on the sea to go into a storm? See, storms, watch this, storms show your foundations. So if you're in the middle of a storm in your life, it's because God's testing your, your, your foundation. You know, I look back over 60 years of ministry. We've been through so much, man. It, but it's, I look back and say all of it has been, it, it, God arranged much of it because He's showing us how to build properly. It takes time. And that's why a lot of people don't go into education. They say, I don't need training. And education's a good thing to lay a good foundation. So, you, so the revelation that you're operating on has a good foundation. By the way, this is a good foundation. This word. It's called the sure word of prophecy. It's called the gospel of truth. In a world of deception and lies, how much today is being built on the sand? All those oligarchs that were in Russia thought they had a pretty good deal going until all their yachts went away. <laughs> Some of them were 300 foot yachts. You know, people build on different foundations. I want to make sure the foundation I'm built on is solid. Amen? And I believe Kingdom Life University is built on a solid foundation. How many agree with me? Raise your hand out there in, in Neverland. All right. Uh, <laughs> I believe that we're building a good foundation. Why? Because we've had the test of time, Carol. Have we had the test of time? Hello. We've been through it. So here Jesus is in the middle of the yeah, Sea of Galilee. And there, and there are things called lilac storms. They, they swirl. They were called lilac forms, storms on Sea of Galilee. And even... Great fishermen, if you, if you travel to the Sea of Galilee, the way that valley flows in Israel, the, the wind comes in there and in a very few moments can be a tumultuous, very dangerous storm on the Sea of Galilee. So here Jesus is asleep. Do you ever feel like God's sleeping in the storm? Sometimes. Help! It says the disciples had to purposely shake him to wake him. 
He was so at peace. What did he say? Let us go to the what? Other side. Other side. You think they were going to sing? Can you imagine reading in the Jerusalem news? Jesus and the 12 disciples went down at sea. Uh, last night, we have a bad report here. They were crossing the sea in a little boat. And, and we just uh, were sad to report that the Son of God, the Creator of all the universe, is at the bottom of the Sea of Galilee now. That's the way some of us act. In the middle of the storm. And they screamed out, Jesus, we perish! Hello. If Jesus is on board your ship, don't worry. Or your boat. You're not going to sink. Hallelujah. God's good. So are you building on the sand or the rock? Rock is slower, firmer, hard work. Do you think that's hard work? Show that again. Do you think that was hard work holding those bricks up that mountain? I'll bet you that was a lot of work. Yes. But that thing was built in the 16th century. Still standing. Yeah. That's cool. yeah. All right. I had to find that. You know, something from the 16th century. And therefore, whatsoever, whosoever hears these words or these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. The rain descended. The floods came. The winds blew. We had that a few well, a week or so ago and beat on that house, and it did not fall. For it was founded upon a rock. Amen. Did not fall. I want my house to stand. And not fall. Well, so we looked at three things today about the, the kingdom, all right? The treasure of the kingdom, the value of it, the authority of it, and also the secrets of it. Some of the top secrets. The last two. Man, I wish I had time to spend on all these. But the parables are a lot of fun. And I understand, Jill, that you're writing your... Or Kim. Jill. Hello, Jill. You just jumped over the other side. Kim, uh, you're writing your thesis, your doctor thesis, on what? Parables. Wow. So she was surprised when uh, she came into the classroom and heard me that uh, I was going to be teaching on parables. So... I only got something out of these parables. Did you get something these weeks out of the parable? And God